We're good? Okay. All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. All right. I like the excitement. Yes. Okay. That was a good midrash we had earlier. Amen. I enjoyed it. Did you guys enjoy it? Yes. yes. Getting better every week. Dwayne's noncommittal again. Look at him. He's not committing to anything today. <laughs> Nancy jab him. If he doesn't say no, it's a yes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to continue life or death. Your decisions matter, right? Motive and intent. And really, we've been talking about that all day. Mm -hmm. um, everything that we went through in the Parsha this week, is it's all about motive and intent. And, and uh, even our whys and what we get into and the directions we go in Scripture. And, you know, we talked about prophecy. We talked about a lot of different things. It, it's all, you know, everything that we do, everything that we do, is about motive and intent. And ultimately, it either brings life or it brings death. There is no in-between. There's no gray area. There's no riding the fence. There's no lukewarm. It's either life or death. And again, you know, we talked about it kind of, we stirred this, this teaching up specifically again because of taking your thoughts captive. And uh, we got to take every thought captive. And we talked about, you know, there's about 13 million decisions a year that we make. That's incredible when you stop and think about it. And it's the reason why decisions are the most important thing in all of this, our, our motive, our why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Or why are we thinking what we're thinking? Or, you know, um, what's behind? What's the heart behind, you know, what we're doing? You know, where's our heart really at? Where are our motives? Our why? So we talked about mania, right? And chavana, which is motive and intent. I'm going to go through the definitions again one more time. And I'll try to go slower. Um, I apologize for the past few weeks. I guess I've been going a little bit too fast. Um, and uh, so when I give the verses, I'll try to slow down. And just remind me if I start going too fast. Because I just kind of get caught in the moment. Um, so mania or motive is the underlying reason for a course of action. Scripture stresses the importance of doing things with the intention of honoring and glorifying God and building up his people. So that really should be the, you know, basically the core, the core of what we're doing, right? Is bringing him honor and glory and building up each other. That should be the driving factor be behind everything that we do or say or um, even, you know, going to work or whatever we do in our, in our personal lives. It should be those two things, first and foremost, of, uh, of our focus. So, Okay, so a few words, and I'll, I'm going to run through these quick because so, we've already been through them a couple times, but I think it's important as a reminder. Words that mean... The same thing as mania or motive or reason, motivation, rationale, grounds, cause, basis, occasion, thinking, object, purpose, design, incentive, inducement, impulse, incitement, influence, lure, inspiration, stimulus, stimulation, spur, goad, provocation, pressure, persuasion, consideration, theme, idea, concept, subject, topic, or element. And some descriptive words for mania or motive are kinetic, driving, impelling, propelling, propulsive, operative, moving motor. So again, you can see it's kind of the beginning of everything. I mean, it's what, it's what sets everything into motion. And the next step is havana or intent, which is concentrating the mind in the performance of an act. So that's the actual physical action of something beginning, you know, putting that plan um, into motion and things moving forward. So, and we need to ensure that it does not, does not devolve into only a mechanical action. It doesn't matter how many people you help or what you do or how good of a person you are or how kind or how giving or how focused on the Father you are if you're just doing it out of a mechanical action. If your motive really isn't what's driving it. Because at that point, you're really just doing it to be seen. So your motive behind it is ugly. It, there's no value. You might as well just quit. 
give up because it's not going to go anywhere. Abba's looking at our motive. He wants to see our why. We talked about that testing earlier, right, in the Midrash. And it's that testing that, you know, he's looking at our motive to see why we're doing what we're doing. And then from there, he's going to look at how we're going to walk that out. Our chavana, or intent. You know, what, what, what plan we're going to put into action to perform the act that we're going to go with. And, and really, that's the driving factor. And see, when we talked about Avraham earlier, right? And whether he was perfect or not perfect or whatever before the father. You can put whatever word you want to it. But ultimately, you know, that's exactly what Abba was looking at was what is his motive and his intent? How is he walking this out? Why is he walking this out? You know, he could have went before the father like Abba commanded him to, but he could have been grumbling and grumping like the Israelites, right, when they were in the desert. And it probably wouldn't have gone very well for him. But his motive and his intent, his mania and chavana were, were correct before the father. And so the father looked kindly upon him and really blessed him for that. And that's exactly what we need to look. If we're, if we're missing something in life or we're feeling like, you know, something's not quite right, we need to go back and check, check ourselves. And again, as we were sharing earlier, you know, a lot of times that's by a close brother or sister or a group that you're part of, you know, really being accountable to that group whatever it is, big or small, um, that, that's, that safe place of people that you can really rely on to be honest and sincere with you. To make sure that we're walking this out correctly and that our motive behind it is good. You know, a lot of people, you know, <laughs> there's so many people that, you know, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but there's so many people that have a decision to make and they use the excuse, and that's what it becomes as an excuse, even though it's a good act, but they use the excuse of prayer. Well, I'll pray about that. Well, I'm going to pray about this. Well, I'm going to pray about this. And they never really put anything into motion. You know, they're waiting for the Father to give them, I don't know, a download or something or whatever um, in order to put these things in motion. And again, their motive and intent is all wrong because really what, what is this life about? He's testing us. He's trying to see what we're about. And we're always trying to put it off on him. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to him with these things. So don't take it the wrong way. Like, that's not a good thing. It is a good thing. But we have to check our why. Why are we doing it that way? Why are we, why are we walking it out that way? Um, so we really just need to keep that in perspective. Um, as we... Uh, you know, when we, when we say basically, oh, I'll pray about that. Well, most of the time, most of the time it's an excuse because they really don't want to do it. They really don't want to put forth the effort or, you know, um, but they don't want to tell you no. Or they don't want to say no. They're just using it as kind of a cop out. I'm just going to pray about that. Or, you know, you've given them a suggestion and they really don't want to take it again. So they'll just throw, oh, I'm just going to pray about that. Thank you. You know, which is just kind of blowing you off. They're really not going to pray about it. Their motive is all incorrect. Um, but there is nothing wrong with taking things before the Father. And he wants us to reach out to him and plead to him and take these things and, and uh, you know, really test them out. But in the end, he wants to, us to see, he wants to see us put them into motion. He wants us to, uh, he wants to see why we come to the conclusion we did and then how we start putting it into effect. Right? It's kind of like, you know, with Avraham, my math teacher years ago, you know, used to say, I really don't care what your answer is. That's a small part uh, of your score. You know, it's really the work. How did you get there? What was the, the procedure, you know, in arriving to that answer? The answer was, you know, if you had 10 problems, you know, 10 points per, per problem, one point would be your answer. Nine points is how you worked it out. And that's really what Abba's looking at. And that's your motive and intent in this case. He's really testing your why. And how are you going to walk it out? How are you going to lay it out before him? And that's what he did with Abraham as well. And Abraham passed that test. Because his motives were pure before him. 
and he put things into motion and did exactly what the father expected of him, right? <coughs> so having our intent, concentrating the mind in the performance of an act, and we need to ensure that it does not devolve into a mechanical action. Words that mean the same, aim, purpose, intention, objective, object, goal, target, end, design, plan, scheme, resolve, resolution, determination, desire, ambition, idea, dream, aspiration, hope. So those are words that mean the same. Some descriptive words are bent, set, determined, insistent, fixed, resolved, hell-bent, keen. Um, and then some opposite words, the exact opposite of where we should be, is half-hearted or reluctant. And that's normally <laughs> where we tend to operate most of the time, half-hearted or reluctant. We do it because we got to do it. You know, we don't go out and mow the grass because it needs to be mowed. It's like, you know, or that you want to mow it or you want your neighbors to think you got a nice yard or whatever the case may be. You know, you do it because it's too tall. Now I've got to do it. It's kind of half-hearted. You know, you're really not putting your all into it. And I'm a culprit of that too. So anybody that's been to my house has seen my yard. So, um, what's that? <laughs> we're not mowing it enough now. We're just not, we're not taking things captive and really determining, you know, what we're doing and how we're going to act this out, you know, and, and what the effects are going to be. So, okay, so we've been through motive for a couple of weeks. Um, we've got a few more verses that I'd like to go through. Um, and we've been pointing out that basically heart is motive and spirit is intent, right? And we've been showing some verses to back that up. And we're going to continue with that a little bit this week. And I'm just going to read a few other notes that we've got. Up until now, we have most mostly focused on how our motive affects our relationship with the Father. Scripture reflects the wide range of motives which influence human behavior. That's really what most of Scripture is about, right? Is for us to learn the influence that their decisions, you know, had on them and their outcome and try to learn from that. That's, that's really why we should be in there, not to learn something if somebody else doesn't know and beat them over the head with it or, you know, any other bad motive that we could have for, for uh, learning and educating ourselves in Scripture, but it should be so that we can learn and see from the examples of where they went wrong or failed. Um, in whatever situation that is, so that hopefully we can avoid that, that pitfall. And it's the same thing we do with our children, right? I mean, that's the way we raise our kids. We learned, we made mistakes, and so we try to hopefully avoid them making the same mistakes or help them avoid making the same mistakes that we made. So that's really should be our, our focus. You know, we have the Torah, which kind of gives us the guidelines. We know who... Mashiach is and what he did for us and, and without him, you know, we've, we've really got no hope in a sense. Um, but, you know, it, it's really just assessing where we're at and, and helping us out in the situations or problems because most of it's stories. Um, but it's good stories. Good stories with value, stories with meaning. And that's what we should be coming here to learn more about. So that's what we're going to use these as today is to hopefully show us some examples of how not to think about a situation or, or uh, taking a thought captive and then how to use a situation um, to fulfill a specific goal or purpose. So we're going to look at motives are sometimes misjudged. So let's take a look at Numbers 32. We're going to read a little bit here. Um, we're going to read most of the chapter, 1 through 33, just so that we can get some of the context. Um, and we just went through this a little while back, so you'll probably see the motive, <coughs> you know, kind of jump out at you as we go along. So the descendants of Reuben and the descendants of Gad had a very large number of livestock, and they saw the land of 
uh, Yazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, it was a good place for livestock. The descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuben came, and they said to Moshe and to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the community, saying, Adaroth, Devon, Yazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elile, uh, Sibam, Nebo, and Beon. The land that Yahweh struck before the community of Israel is a land of livestock, and your servants have livestock. They said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as property. Do not lead us across the Jordan. But Moshe said to the descendants of Gad and to the descendants of Reuben, will your brothers go to war while, you're, uh, while yourselves live here? Why are you discouraging the hearts of the Israelites from crossing into the land that Yahweh gave to them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. When they went up to the valley of Eshkol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the Israelites so that they did not come to the land that Yahweh gave uh, to them. So Yahweh's anger burned on that day and he swore an oath saying, the men who went up from Egypt from those 20 years old and above will not see the land that I swore with an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb, son of Yephanah, and the Kenizzite, and Yahshua, son of Nun, because they followed Yahweh wholly. And Yahweh became angry, and he made them wander in the desert 40 years until the entire generation who did evil and the sight of Yahweh had died. Behold, you stand in the place of your fathers, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more Yahweh's fierce anger against Israel. If you turn from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you would have destroyed all these people. They came near to him and said, We will build sheep pens here for the flocks of our livestock and cities for our little children, but we ourselves will become armed and ready before the Israelites until we have brought them to their place and our little children will live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our houses until the Israelites each obtain their inheritance for themselves. For we will not take the possession with them from across the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has come to us from across the Jordan to the east. So Moshe said to them, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before Yahweh for the war, and every one of you armed cross the, uh, the Jordan before Yahweh until he has driven out the enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before Yahweh, then afterward you will return and be free of the obligation from Yahweh and from Israel, and this land will be your property before Yahweh. But if you do not do so, behold, you have sinned against Yahweh, and know that your sin will find you. Build for yourselves cities for your children and sheep pens for your flocks. What has gone out from your mouth you will do. So the descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuben said to Moshe, saying, Your servants will do just as my Lord commands. Our little children, our wives, our livestock, and all of our animals will remain in the cities of Gilead. But your servants, everyone who is armed for battle, will cross over before Yahweh to the war, just as my Lord says. So Moshe commanded them, Eleazar the priest, Yahshua son of Nun, and the heads of the families of the tribes of the Israelites. Moshe said to them, if the descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuben, everyone who is armed for the war, cross over the, uh, the yard and before Yahweh, and the land is subdued before you, you will give them the land of Gilead as property. But if they will not cross over with you armed, they will acquire land in your midst in Canaan. The descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuben answered and said, What well, Yahweh has commanded your servants, we will do. We ourselves will cross over arm before Yahweh um, to the land of Canaan and the property of our inheritance. There will remain with us beyond the Arden. So you can see there the, the motive and intent. Motives are sometimes misjudged. Moshe was misjudging what they were really trying to achieve. They weren't saying that they weren't going to go fight with their brothers. 
you know, um, um, alongside of their brothers. Um, they were just saying that we would like this land, but we'll go and cross over and we'll go with until the land is subdued and then we'll return. So you can see sometimes again, you know, it was a good motive. Their motive was pure, what they were doing, uh, but sometimes it's misjudged as something bad. So let's take a look at um, 2 Samuel 10, 1 through 4. Afterwards, the king of the Ammonites died. Did I give you, give you enough time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Afterwards, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son, Hanun, ruled in his place. David said, I will show loyal love with Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father showed loyal love with me. So David sent to console him concerning his father by the hand of his servants, and the servants of David came to the land of the Ammonites. But the commanders of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their master, In your opinion, is David honoring your father because he has sent condolences to you? Is it not in order to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it, that David sent his servants to you? Then Hanun took the servants of David, and he shaved off half of their beards and cut their, gar uh, their garments off in the middle, up to their buttocks, then sent them away. So again, we can see here, David had a pure motive, a pure intent. What? You like this translation? <laughs> yeah, but you can see here that David, you know, he his motive was pure. It was real, it was good. Um, and what he was doing, but it was perceived as something else. It was completely misjudged by um, the leaders of that land. So let's take a look at 2 Kings 5, 5 through 7. So we need to understand, you know, as we go along here too, as, as, uh, as our motives sometimes are misjudged, we need to, again, take that thought captive before we um, answer wrong with wrong. You know what I mean? Because so often we tend to react and respond because our motive was pure, um, but it was misjudged, and then we attack, and our motive is all wrong. So, you okay, Yochanan? Okay. <laughs> um, so, just to make sure that, you know, we aren't doing wrong as, as just because they did wrong. So, we, we just need to be careful of that, because it's an easy trap to fall into. Okay, so we are in 2 Kings 5, 5 through 7. So the king of Aram said, what's that? Oh, I thought I already announced it. Sorry about that. Okay, I did. Excellent. Okay, so 2 Kings 5, 5 through 7. So the king of Aram said, go, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He went and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. So he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter comes to you, I have just sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him from his skin disease. It happened that when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to cause death or, li or to give life? This man is sending a man to me to cure his disease. Indeed, but know and see that he seeks an opportunity against me. So here's another example of the same thing that, um, you know, his, the, the motive behind the reason for this was being completely misjudged. They thought it was coming, they were coming to spy out the land. Okay, let's take a look at another topic here. Yeshua's actions motivated by a desire to do God's will. So we're going to look at, let's go to Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. We're actually going to start in 5, though. 5 through 8. Yeah, let's do 5 through 8. So Yeshua's actions motivated by a desire to do God's will. So I want you guys to, again, think about the motive here. 
as we go through it um, to pick it out because this is good practice for you when you start pondering your own thoughts or your own decisions or you've got your own decisions to make laying in front of you, getting in practice for really taking your thought captive to see what your motive is. Uh, we are in Psalm 40, 6 through eight, or 5 through 8, yes. But it's uh, us taking our thoughts captive as well. You know, this seems so simple, and it is. It is simple, but yet it's very complex. It takes a lot of practice and exercise to force yourself to do this before responding, especially when you're in the heat of a moment or, you know, um, you know, you have to show patience and ponder things, you know, slow to respond sometimes. You know, Dwayne's seen me in situations where I'm slow to respond and I just take it all in and I just ponder it and mull it over. And he's probably thinking, why don't you say something already? But yeah, I have to really ponder my motive behind what I'm doing. Is it just to lash back out in a situation or is it to get revenge or, you know, is it to hurt them because they hurt me or to insult them because they insulted me or what is the situation? Um, and so we really have to take that thought captive. So, okay, verse five. <clears throat> Many things, O Yahweh, my God, you have done, your wonderful deeds and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I tried to proclaim and tell of them, they would be too numerous to count. A sacrifice and offering you do not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offerings you have not demanded. Then I said, look, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written concerning me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is deep within me. So again, we can see Yeshua's actions coming there, which is kind of a, <clears throat> a shadow picture of the Messiah, you might say. I mean, really, it's pretty... It's pretty apparent, but Yeshua's actions motivated by the desire to do God's will. Okay, let's take a look at, we're going to jump to John chapter 8, verse 29. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I have always or because I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So again, you know, he's taken his thought captive and, and, and the reason why the motive behind what he's doing. And so what is he saying about this? He doesn't have to wonder. He doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to. He has no doubt in him because he's there to do the will of the father. So he knows what his motive is. He's taken his thought captive and he's acting it out. And he doesn't have to second guess. He doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to debate, you know, whether or not or why. And we were kind of talking about that earlier. And really, if we're taking those thoughts captive and we're really there to do his work, which we defined his work, right, is a relationship with him and a relationship with those that are in front of us, our brothers and sisters, that's really the purpose why we're here, right? <coughs> okay, let's take a look at John 4.34. Yeshua said to them, My food is that I do the will of the one who sent me and complete his work. So again, it's a repeat of the other one, but it's a second, another confirmation of him just doing the will of the Father. And here he's saying, basically, I don't even have to worry about my food or what I'm going to eat or what I'm going to wear or anything else because I know the Father's going to take care of me because I'm doing his will, right? Ultimately, like, ultimately, let's take a look at 638 in John as well. Because I have come down from heaven... Not that I should do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. So again, he's just confirming the same thing here. That Yeshua and everything that he did, and you know, his very purpose was to do the will of the Father. Which really should be our very purpose, right? Is to do the will of the Father. 
and to walk this out as well. So let's take a look one last um, in this category uh, on Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. We'll look at five through seven. But Shaul said, what, to imitate me as I imitate Messiah, right? And we know that we're to be walking this out and, and trying to become in the likeness of, of Yeshua. So as we do that, we should be doing as he did. And he took every thought captive. And he was there not to do nothing but the will of the Father. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, verse, verses 5 through 7. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not want, but a body you prepared for me. You did not delight in the whole burnt offerings and offerings of sin. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the role of the book it is written about me to do your will, O God. So that's a direct quote back to Psalms where we started, right? Psalm 40. So we can see here is just a confirmation. So we've got several witnesses here. Okay, so we're going to look at some of Paul's motives and see what Shell's got to to do with this. Um, let's jump to, I guess we'll just go to 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 6. Actually, I think I'm going to back up. Let's, let's go to, uh, to, yeah, let's go to verse 1. We'll start in 1. 2, 1. One through six. <coughs> For you yourselves know, brothers, our reception with you, that it was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, just as you know, we had the courage in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation is not from error or from impurity or with deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message. Thus we speak, not as pleasing people, but God, who examines our hearts. For never did we come with a word of flattery, just as you know, nor with the pretext of greediness, and Abba's witness, nor seeking glory from people, neither from you nor from others. So again, Shaul's just proving here that his motive is pure. And he says, you know, in verse 4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message, thus we speak not as people, pleasing people, but God who examines our hearts. So again, it's a confirmation that Abba is just examining our hearts. He's testing us in everything that we doing, everything that we do, and he's watching us on a daily basis how we make the decisions. And we just talked about how many decisions we make a year. Seventeen million. Or thirteen million was it thirteen? Oh. Oh yeah, twelve twelve million seven hundred thousand, sorry. Okay. It's still a lot. It's a lot. So, and that's what Abba is doing is testing us as we walk this out to see if we are a people that he wants to spend eternity with, right? So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17. For we are not like the majority who peddled the word of God, but as from pure motives, but as from God, we speak before God and Messiah. So again, you can see his motives are pure. He wasn't there to make money. He wasn't worried about, you know, the three feasts and he was trying to usurp everything and take everybody's money. He was there for pure motives. He had a clean conscience. Um, he was not there for selfish gain. And so he would acknowledge that again before the father and before the people as well. Okay, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 9, 9 through 12. Therefore, indeed, we have as our ambition, whether at home in the body or absent from the body, to be acceptable to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, 
in order that each one may receive back the things through the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, because we know the fear of the Lord, we are attempting to persuade people, but we are revealed to God, and I hope to be revealed in our consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to boast about us in order that you uh, may have an answer for those uh, that boast in appearance and not in heart. So again, he's just laying out his motives before the people. And it's, it's that testing again and not in heart, he says. So testing of the motives. And that's what we should be doing. Look, when I have a, a relationship with Anthony or with Patrick or whoever I'm discussing, I should be testing those motives too, testing your whys to see who you really are. We talked about earlier the discipline without relationship breeds rebellion. Why is that? Because as we build a relationship, then I understand Patrick's motives, you know, and I can start seeing a picture that he's painting before me and that gives me either concern because I don't trust his motives or it gives me confidence that I can trust his motives. And then therefore he can correct me because I trust where he's coming from. Or he can't correct me because I don't trust where he's coming from. But if I just encounter him, uh, you know, for a short time, a five minute window, and he's already trying to correct me and, you know, change everything that I'm doing and we don't even have a relationship, then I'm immediately gonna throw up a red flag because he's not even willing to build a relationship, you know, his motive appears all incorrect. So we shouldn't be trying to correct people in the first five minutes of meeting them. We should be willing to build that relationship with them and have that level of trust and then be able to, um, you know, have that relationship and that, that level of relationship where they can speak into our lives. Okay, so we're gonna look at a couple selfless motives and then after this, we're going to let motive rest for a while. We're going to look at some Havana or intent. Okay, let's go to let's go to Philippians four fourteen through eighteen. And again, we're looking at selfish or selfless selfless motive. Um, yeah, fourteen through eighteen. Nevertheless, you have done well by sharing with me in my affliction. Now you also know, Philippians, that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, that no ecclesia or no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Because even in Thessalonica, on more than one occasion, you sent for my need not that I seek the gift, but I seek for the profit that increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am well supplied because I received from um, Epaphroditus what you had sent, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So again, we see here he's just, it's, it's a selfless motive, but he's sharing with them that they have provided for him well, that they have taken care of him, that they're and, and he's sharing that they're they had selfless motives, they had nothing in it to gain for themselves, and even while he's off taking care of other people, they're still supporting and taking care of him um, as he's doing the work that the Father had laid before him. So they just had completely selfless motives. Okay, let's go to Philippians 1, 22 through 26. But if it is to live in the flesh, this is fruitful work for me, and which I will prefer, I do not know. But I am hard pressed between the two options, having the desire to depart and to be with Messiah for this is the very this is very much better but to stay on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake and because I am convinced of this 
I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and in, fa in the faith so that what you um, can be proud of may increase in Messiah because of my because of me through my return again to you. So again, Shaul saying here he would just love to go as he's in you know in um, in prison. I mean he's he's just saying that I would love to go and be with Messiah, but you know I think the best thing for me right now is to stay here even though I don't want to be here, but I'm here for you, and you need me, and so that's what I would rather do at this point. But his first option would be to go, right? So we see his selfless motive. And he's willing to preserve or to increase his suffering, his situation, stay in the, uh, the ugly that he was in at the time um, for the sake of somebody else. Therefore, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, we are in Philemon, Philemon 8 through 14. Mm -hmm. 8 through 14. Yeah, verses 8 through 14. It wasn't a trick answer. I wasn't trying to trick you. Okay, therefore, although I have great confidence in Messiah to order you to do what is proper, instead I appeal to you because of love. Since I am such a one as Paul, now an old man and also a prisoner of Messiah, I am appealing to you concerning my child, whom I became the father of during my imprisonment, Onesimus. Once he was useless to you, but now he is use, uh, useful to you and to me, whom I have sent back to you himself, that is, my heart, whom I wanted to keep with me in order that he might serve me on behalf of you during my imprisonment for the gospel. So again, we see that, you know, that Paul's motives here are completely selfless. And that what he's doing and he's testing. It says, that is my heart whom I wanted to help with me in order that they might serve me on behalf of you during my imprisonment for the gospel. But apart from your consent, I wanted to do nothing in order that your good deed might be not according to the necessity, but according to your own free will. So he was giving them the option even though it was going to cost him something. So it was a selfless motive um, that Shaul had there. So, so that kind of covers motive. Uh, we might bounce back to a few things. But uh, um, let's take a look at havana or intent. Again, as we go through this, we're going to be concentrating the mind and the performance of an act. We need to ensure that it does not devolve into only a mechanical action. So let's take a look. Um, the purpose of proper intention is transformation of the soul. Or our goal is to become like in, or in the likeness of Messiah. The true goal for man is to do what he does, right? Clean hands, a covered body, clean space, removal of distractions are only part of the equation. The next part <laughs> is our intention. So let's look at intention. So plans or actions we're going to take a look at. Designs or schemes preparing it in advance of doing something. Scripture tells us the sovereign plans of Yahweh and the varied plans of men and women. So let's take a look at Abba's plans for judgment and we will start in, let's go to Numbers 33. Yeah, the chapter 33, verses 55 and 56. Sorry, see, now you got me going so slow, I lose track. <laughs> okay, verse 55, chapter 33 of Numbers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from your presence, then it will happen that whomever you let remain of them 
will be like irritants in your eyes and like thorns in your sides. They will be your enemies in the land in which you live. And just as I planned to do to them, I will do to you. So you can see there, there's one of Abba's plans, his intent, his uh, havana, and the way he's going to start putting that into motion. Okay, let's take a look at, we're just going to bounce. I'm not going to worry about order or whatever. It's fine. Jeremiah 18, verse 11. Is this making sense to you guys? Are you guys seeing the importance of? It's huge. It's in everything. Yochanan, are you awake? Okay. Does it embarrass you when I call you out? I guess it just depends on your motive or intent. <laughs> oh, because I love him, that's why. Okay, so <laughs> Jeremiah 18, verse 11. So now then, say please to the people. So now then, say please to the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, thus says Yahweh, look, I am preparing evil against you, and I am planning a plan against you. Please turn back each one from his evil way and walk rightly in your ways and your deeds. But they will say it is hopeless, for we will go after our own plans, and each one of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. So again, they had an option here. Abba come before him just as he's come before us. And he's given us the correct plan, the correct path. He's given us a way to escape all the ugly. And yet we still continue to choose the wrong path. Normally because the, uh, the wrong path looks easy or it's fun or it's more enjoyable or there's more entertainment in it or whatever the case may be. And so we take the easy way out. Um, Rather than refraining from or telling ourselves no or taking our thoughts captive, we just run off and do it anyways. So, okay, let's take a look at, let's go to Jeremiah 26.3. You know, I have to say, I stand up here and, you know, I just, it's like, this is so, I really feel like it's so elementary, but yet we don't get it because we don't do it. I really just want to share with you from it. It's a struggle for me too. We're all in the same boat here. And this is so simple. This is like so basic, but it's the very core of all of it. And yet we struggle so much with it. We struggle so much with it. Something gets said, something happens, whatever, the kids do something, the spouse says something, a friend says something, we don't take our thoughts captive, we, do, we don't, we just react. We just react, we go off the deep end, ends up in a fight, whatever. Then more things happen on top of that. It keeps compounding, it keeps growing. Pretty quick, everybody's getting off Telegram and everybody's arguing and fighting or you know, people are getting divorced or children are becoming rebellious because of it because it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. I mean, this is the core of it. It's the beginning of it. If we don't have this, then look, <laughs> you know, this is like so, this is the beginning of steps. If we can't take our thoughts captive, if we really can't assess whether or not we're going in the right direction, if we really can't assess whether our, our thoughts are pure and according to his will and desires or not, or if we just ignore them and go on anyways, we're in trouble. Then after we hit that trouble, we have the gall to say, where did I go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is so simple, but it is so complex because it, t it, it takes every effort, everything that we do. This is at the beginning of everything that we do. Uh, why did you come here today? You know, you know, why? Why did you work last week? 
Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? You know what I mean? We have to have a reason behind everything that we're doing. <coughs> so it is in everything. It is in everything. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, Jeremiah 26. Sorry about that. My allergies are getting the best of me. I think everybody's got that problem right now. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 3. Perhaps they will listen and turn back each from his evil way. And I will relent of the disaster that I am planning to do to them because of their evil deeds. And you shall say to them, thus says Yahweh, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets whom I have sent to you over and over again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city I will make a curse for all the nations of the earth. See, Abba's, I mean, well, Jeremiah here, but he's, Abba's speaking through him. He's got the same frustration. He's done this over and over. He said it over and over. How many times have we read it in the book of Deuteronomy in the last, you know, few weeks? Um, it's over and over and over again, but yet we continue to fail. Israel failed at this. Even after all the warnings, they continued to do it the opposite way. And they suffered because of it. So what do you think we're going to do? What are the odds? that we're going to walk out the same exact situation and not learn from it. If you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you over and over again. See, he's getting frustrated too. <clears throat> he really is. He's getting frustrated because he keeps repeating the same thing. And the same bad things keep happening. Though you have not listened then I will make this house, so on and so forth. So hopefully you're listening. Hopefully I'm not putting you to sleep. Okay, let's take a look at Isaiah 25, 1 through 2. That's one of them. Um, where'd she go? Where'd the artist go? We need to write down that verse. We need that up on the wall. No, the other one, Jeremiah 26. We need that verse up on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, it was Jeremiah, yeah, 23. Three th yeah, 3 through 6. Okay, um, Isaiah 25, sorry. It went off in a different direction. Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans of old, in faithfulness, trustworthiness. So again, he's lifting up and elevating these plans. And these plans, they're not all fun, enjoyable plans. Some of them are pretty tough plans. They're plans of punishment and how he's going to deal with those that are heading down the wrong road. And he's calling them in faithfulness and trustworthiness, right? Because he's going to do what he said he set out to do. There, there's, he's not going to make any exceptions. You're not going to be able to get out of this one. You're not going to be able to sit there and plead and beg and make excuses um, for your ugliness. You're going to be held accountable. Let's take a look at Micah chapter 2 verse 3. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, look, I am planning disaster against this family from which you will not be able to remove your necks. You will not walk proudly for it is a time of disaster. So again, the, actually, we're going to bounce back up to give you a little bit of context. Let's go to uh, verse one, two, one, and we'll read to three. Woe to those who plan wickedness and evil deeds upon their beds. In the light of the morning they did it because they have power in their hands. They covet fields and seize them 
and houses and they have taken them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, look, I am planning disaster against this family from which you will not be able to remove your necks. You will not walk proudly for it is a time of disaster. So it's going to get really bad and really ugly for these people. Abba is going to walk out his judgment whether you like it or not. If you fall into that category, it's not going to be pleasant. Okay, let's take a look at prophecies against the enemies of Yahweh. Actually, prophecy against the enemies of Yahweh's people is where we're going to go. And we're going to start in, let's go to Jeremiah 49.20. Therefore, hear the plan of Yahweh that he has planned against Edom and his plans that he has planned against the inhabitants of Taman. Surely they will drag them away and the little ones of the flock. Surely he will cause to be desolate, desolated over them, their grazing place. The earth will quake in the sound of their falling. A cry of distress, their voice will be heard at the Red Sea. So again, this is another plan that Abba is going to walk out. Prophecies against the enemies of Yahweh's people. Let's take a look at chapter 50, verse 45. 50:45. Yes. I'm going to give you a few more verses and then we're going to wrap it up for today. Therefore, hear the plan of Yahweh that he has planned against Babylon and his plans, that he has planned against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely they will drag them away, the little ones of the flock. Surely he will cause the grazing place to be desolate over them. At the sound, Babylon has been captured. The earth will quake and a cry for help among the nations will be heard. So again, there's no doubt that Abba is going to have his will um, in these situations. We're not going to escape it. Nobody's going to escape it. You're not going to be able to get away from it. Let's take a look at Isaiah and we're going to start in verse 24, read to 27. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Isaiah 14, 24 through 27. Yahweh of hosts, uh, Yahweh of hosts has sworn saying, surely just as I have intended, so it shall be. And just as I have planned, it shall stand to break Assyria in my land. And I will trample him down on my mountains and he shall remove his yoke from them and he shall remove his burden from his shoulders. This is the plan that is planned concerning all of the earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For Yahweh of hosts has planned and he who will frustrate it and his hand is stretched out and who will turn it back. So nobody's going to turn it back. Nobody's going to frustrate it. He's going to have his will with those, whether it's good or it's bad, he's going to have, his plan is going to be walked down. There, again, there's no escaping it. Let's take a look at, we'll go with one more and then we'll wrap up there. Let's go to Micah chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And now many nations are gathered against you who are saying, let her be defiled and let her eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of Yahweh and they do not understand his plans that he has gathered them as sheaves to his threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make as iron and your hooves as bronze and you will break many peoples in pieces and their gain you will devote to destruction to Yahweh and their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Yeah, exactly. He will have his way with us. It doesn't really matter. We're not going to escape it. Um, we need to be looking at what he's laid out before us. He's given us all the warnings. He's told us how to walk this out. He's told us how to do this. And we keep making excuse after excuse of why. We can't walk it out. 
So I understand Jeremiah and his crying out and pleading. And I mean, he he pleaded and begged and pleaded and begged and spent his a good part of his life, you know, just trying to wake up the people and to open their eyes. And they continued to do exactly what they wanted to do, whatever their heart desired, whatever their motive, whatever their motive was, they continued to walk it out. They didn't change, they didn't relent, and they suffered because of it time and time and time again. So again, we have all these things in front of us. So are we going to continue to do the same thing or are we going to make the adjustments? And I know that, yeah, some of these things might look a little bit different in, in our time and place, but I mean, my goodness, we can't even handle the simple things. You know, we can't even get together with two or three people and get along for more than a few hours at a time. Well, see, Sukkot's coming. It's going to oh. be fun. We're going to really get to know each other. Yeah, we're going to have some fun up there. It'll be good. It'll be a time for us to really hopefully build that relationship and that level of trust so that we can speak into each other's lives. Yeah, we're going to here shortly, so yeah. So it, it'll, be a, it'll be a great time to open that door um, for us to grow as a community since we are a young community. You know, some of us have had relationships for a while, but, um, you know, but only a few months here and in this direction. So it'll be a great testing ground. And uh, I hope we pass with flying colors. But again, if we don't, Abba's already laid out what we have to look forward to. So don't forget that. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. It's pretty important, you know, because this is what he desires for us to do, right? How did we start out with that relationship with him and relationship with each other? So we better figure that out. We better work on it. We better find a way to be a little more patient and loving and, and considerate of our brothers and sisters. Slow to speak. Keep our mouths shut when we need to. Take our thoughts captive. Extinguish them you know, as quickly as we can. Find a way, whatever it takes. So anyways, let's open it up for discussion. Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little excited. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, first is kind of the more practical n application, I suppose. Um, you know, just taking the thought captive, okay, well, we can keep saying that, but what does that actually look like? And uh, for me, and I'm definitely a work in progress, it's um, just taking a moment to be introspective and say, okay, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to think about what I'm thinking, it's, you know, in the my work environment, it's called metacognition, where you take a moment and actually think about what you're thinking and and um, just have that meditative moment to to pause and reflect on it and question what's my intent and what would the father prefer and um, and and that's all wrapped up in this idea of self control and what are we doing in our lives to practice self control? Well, we know what the secular world is doing; they're doing some really interesting. Well, not really interesting, but weirdo yoga and all the uh, that stuff. But what do we do in the walk to have that practical sense of self-control? Is that prayer? Is that it's reflecting really on his word? I mean, like, yeah. what does that look like down to the... It's really all the fruit of the spirit, isn't it? Love, mm -hmm. joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That's what we need to be weighing it out too. So whatever I'm thinking or whatever I'm doing, when I take that thought captive, when I take that moment um, to really, um, you know, think about what I'm doing, I need to be, uh, you know, matching it up to the fruit of the Spirit. What fruit am I going to produce out of this? It's those that don't take that thought captive that just respond or react, and the fruit is many times not good. And so really it's assessing it according to the fruit that we know that we're called to be producing. And if we're not producing that fruit in this situation, we should either walk away from it until a time when we can produce fruit, good fruit, or 
you know, making that conscious effort right there on the spot to produce that good fruit. If you're not producing good fruit, yeah, you're in serious trouble. And that doesn't mean we can produce one or two or three and say, oh, I got it. It's good. No, 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 no. Yeah. <coughs> we need all. And it's a challenge. Look, it's a, it's a struggle. It's not easy. It's much easier to respond and react in the moment, in the heat of the moment. It's much easier to crawl in a cave. It's much easier to avoid people. You know, it's, it's much easier to avoid relationship and all that stuff or stay home or distance yourself or whatever or just come in and attack people or whatever the case may be. That's much easier. You know, it's, it's harder to build that relationship and keeping the fruit of the Spirit at the forefront of that relationship. So, go ahead. Well, my other thought was, as we were reading about Abba's designs or his plans for judgment, the thought came to me that by learn by looking at his intent and his designs, we can see that he is good because his intent towards us is is good. Um, I mean, the verses we read were more like the other side of that. But if we look from this whole plan of salvation throughout his whole his whole word, it's, it shows his intent towards us to do good for us if, if we desire that and desire to be with him and, and keep his commandments. Um, and just an example of that is in looking at his design, um, the, the red heifer in the temple. It's like the only way that we could ever rebuild the temple is by having that red heifer. And he put that into his design so that we could come back to him. <laughs> that's really, really cool. Yeah, that's what I love about the temple as a whole because we see how everything has a purpose and a place and a time. And, you know, there, there's no chaos there. It's absolute order. That's the way he set up his house. So again, that should be a picture of how we set up our house is in absolute order. There shouldn't be chaos, you know, ensuing it every time we turn around. So anyways, yes, other comp, go ahead. Um, with how to handle each other and, and take thoughts captive on that subject, it's been talked about a lot, but I was doing some reflecting. I think the most absolutely dangerous thing that we do is do anything other than exchange simple information in text and faceless format. Yeah. That is the opposite of panim al panim. You can't gauge their feelings and personality. Actually, uh, call on my brother Tony here. We actually had a situation just like that. He wanted to talk to me about a problem that he perceived. And I, in text, was able to go down a path in my brain and it was absolutely worthless, fruitless, and it almost derailed the whole thing. But face to face, I was able to see his concern, his emotion, his feeling. I was able to, you know, we talk about producing the fruit, but don't just let it fall on the ground. Whenever you have those issues with each other, well, pluck a little patience and feed him some patience and pluck a little gentleness and feed him gentleness and kindness. You are to give that fruit to someone else. If you need to, take a nibble yourself if you're <laughs> lacking in the moment. But you need to ex express those fruits. And so whenever you do talk about something great, I would suggest even when it comes to that moment, don't even call the person to that face-to-face um, -face meeting and only a text. I'd at least let them hear your voice. Or even better, like you've done yourself, Leave the pulpit if you've got to and go seek them out. Knock on their door. Make that initial contact face-to-face -face if possible. It's not always possible, but if you're going to go through another method of communication, be as absolutely transparent. Leave no room for a mess up or whatever and, and try to avoid text at all costs. Text is only good for sharing recipes and pictures of cats. Like You shouldn't really be doing anything serious in a text message. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. Get face-to-face, -face and then 
if you find you're in the situation where your brother or your sister is the one that's aggrieved, or if you sense that they're going first, like you said, that's the bait of the enemy. Oh, they slipped. Now I can be mad too. No, 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 no. That's You doubly need to be patient. You doubly need to be kind. You doubly need to be loving in those moments. So take your, you know, take your licking. If they need to give you a tongue lashing for some reason, let them. You're, you're a grown-up. You're a grown-up. Words do hurt. We're not going to pretend that it's not life and death, but we also have the armor of Elohim. No word will get to you if you stand behind that armor. So let them express themselves. Give them that patience. Give them the time. And don't respond quickly. You know, um, there's a, a study that was shown that if you spend, I think it's 10 or 15 seconds, staring someone in the eyes, in silence, you make a connection that gets you beyond your emotional moment. So just do your best. If you Be the person that's famous for awkward silence. You know, just sit there and give them a, give them a look. Give them that time. It's 10 seconds. It's 10 seconds. You're about to make life or death decisions for both of you, and you don't have 10 seconds? Look at their face. Remember who they are to you. Remember you care about them. Remember who they represent. If they're one of us, they represent Yeshua. You're going to spit in Yeshua's face? You're going to show Yeshua a lack of patience? You're going to show Yeshua a lack of kindness? Whew, not this guy. That's dangerous. You don't want to be there. So give each other time. Give each other that awkward silence if you've got to. And if you find yourself talking and someone's giving you a lot of awkward silence, maybe, maybe take it as a signal and get a little awkward and quiet yourself and just stop and take a moment and reconnect with each other and remember who this person is. This is your brother. This is your sister. Or, you know, depending on the relationship, they're as your mother, as your father, or as a son or as a daughter to you. We're all family. You don't smite your family. Um, pulling up uh, James one nineteen, because um, it seemed a little pertinent to what my brother over there was just saying. Um, trying to find it real quick. Sorry. James one nineteen. Um, know this, my bl beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of Elohim. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Um, speaking of which, I fail in that regularly, so I'm not trying to say that I'm perfect at it, so don't come to me for advice, but <laughs> the point is, is that that's what the book says. We can come to you as an example of what not to do, right? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, I, then, I kind of, then I flip flop on that too. Yeah, I know. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts, questions, anything, statements? Anything online? We're good? Okay, we got a couple back here. What, just one thing that I noticed is for such a small group, we break up into a lot of little groups. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And that's always a challenge. Sukkot will be a good time. And I think p p sometimes that's because people have histories or pasts too, so it's a natural thing. Or maybe they are blood family or they've already been in other relationships together. But... You know, that's where these feasts, um, I love it that Abba gives us so much time to spend together. Because it's really hard to be fake. You know, it it's gives us time to build those relationships. Sitting around a campfire is a no, no better time than to build relationships with each other. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Uh, and it shall come to pass when he hears the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. Okay. Then back to Jeremiah eighteen twelve, which you quoted earlier. Um, and they said, 
There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will go everyone after uh, the stubbornness of his evil heart. It's like a mirror of the two, and I just noticed the connection. Yep, yep, it is definitely. From, from the midrash, that was that was from the midrash earlier, where we were talking about Deuteronomy 29, where it was talking about the man who was going to go after the stubbornness of his own heart, and then it's the connection to Jeremiah 18 verse 12 which is the part where they say, um, and they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will, everyone do after the stubbornness of his evil heart. Yeah. I mean, I'm really sincere in the fact that, you know, this is, it really is very simple and elementary, but it's so difficult and it's so, I mean, it's the toughest thing that, isn't it like Abba? I mean, the, one of the most important things that we could do is so simple, but yet so complex. Profound. You know, yeah, profound. <laughs> um, because, you know, it is in everything. I mean, pick one. Pick one verse out of scripture that doesn't have motive you and intent, you, you know. You did not um, plan these sections of verses for this Parsha, that it no. just, it does, the father just keeps it's, doing it. He yeah, just keeps doing these patterns, yeah. like, especially when we were doing the temple stuff, too. Huh? Yeah. It's like there's always a connection. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think he's trying, I do think, because I think he's preparing us for the next step or the next leg of the journey. And so why is it? Because there's other teachers out there around the world, too that are going over these very same things. And I, it's like, I, people are asking me all the time. It's like, did you know, did you know? It's like, I don't even know who these people are. But I mean, so it's not just here. It's like, this is the season that we're in, you know, of, of repairing and fixing some of these things. And there's many people for various reasons coming from various areas that are in the same, the same situation. Or is it that, the next leg of the journey that we're going to go into, um, we have to have these in order to move on. It's a good question. So I just come back in here, so I don't know what's been said. Um, so I, what I was finding earlier as we were going through, um, it's our it's our evil deeds that keep us from doing what you said, such simple things. Because, well, I don't have it marked anymore, but it was just talking about it. Let me see. Maybe I can find it. No, I lost. Wait, no. Uh, if so be that they listen and each turn from his evil way, then I shall repent of the evil that I plan to do to them because the evil of their deeds. It's our evil deeds that keep us from doing the simple act. So that's yes. one thing I saw from it. Yeah. Definitely, because our motive is out of line. Our motive is not pure before the Father. Our motive and, and our intent is not lined up like we were talking about with the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's the fruit of the enemy that it's lined up with. And that's the evil and the ugly that's in it. Going contrary to, you know, sound doctrine and, and a good place and a relationship with others. Go ahead. Um, the thought came to my mind because of the difficulty of, in theory, doing all this. It's a methodology. It's a general way that you go about your thinking processes, and most of us are not raised with that at all at any point in our lives. I mean, um, like, for example, Orthodox Jews are somewhat raised that way uh, but because they notice the seriousness of doing Torah, but most of us have not been raised that way at all. And so it, it's actually something that takes a lifetime of learning to get down. And when you're just coming into it, like, like the old saying about getting out bad habits out of your life, it takes about 28 days of clean living from whatever that bad habit was to actually have it ingrained enough to where it almost becomes habit. Um, and that's th th what you're talking about is a basically a methodology of thought yeah. that you just stop think and then respond as opposed to behaving like a chemical and reacting. Yep. Excellent. Is that, is that the idea of you could take you could take an Israelite out of Mitzrayim but you can't take the Mitzrayim out of an Israelite and it's like a process of a, a lifetime? Yeah, yeah, it is and definitely. 
and did it, did that affect the the generation that was going to go into the land? Sure. It's still that they it, even in them there was still Mitzrayim in them. Yeah. Yep. No, that's very good, and that's why it's important. You know, we talked about with the school and stuff, but thinking about the next generation coming up or whatever, you know, we need to start preparing the way for them and. We need it to be healthy for them so that they can grow, so that they can avoid these these pitfalls that we're struggling with constantly. You know, so that we can avoid these things and they can have the strength and and uh, the fortitude to move on from that and not have the same struggles that we have, the same habits that we have. So, and we need to set the example. So, anyways, oh, go ahead. In response to uh, what Brother Patrick said about people breaking into groups, we got to remember there's two different kinds of doing that. There's the division, you know, breaking into a us-them group. That's never okay. But we see multiple times in Scripture examples of subgroups within Israel. We see tribes, 12 of them. We see thousands, hundreds, and tens with their own respective leaders. And I think the reason for that is, is you can't really, you know, in this format, we kind of get to know each other. But if you really want to get to know someone, spend some one-on-one -on -one time with them. Well, that's a mm -hmm. subgroup of two. And you can go up to about 7, 8, 9, 10-ish, somewhere in that range, and still have almost the same degree of openness as one-on-one -on -one before it starts to become like this is a more formalized setting. You know, you can't really share everything. It's not an appropriate time, place, or setting. And so we shouldn't let subgrouping so to speak, be a discouragement, and at the same time, we still need to all be as welcoming as Avraham in any of our little subgroups. If someone, you know, if Brother Patrick's wandering from one group to another, say he's sitting with a group of people when it comes to the other one, well, you shouldn't butt up your shoulders and circle him out, you know what I mean? Open your circle up, invite people in, and, and share, because it's another chance. You're mixing up all these variables. It's a chance to see each other's dynamics and finally get to have that community and that knowledge of one another, truly knowing one another. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but something that I was, the reason why I was saying the way I look at it is, is, I mean, everybody here has a very beautiful mind. And I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you have a beautiful mind too, sir. So. We're fortunate to have you here as well. So, and we want to spend t as much time with you as we can. So, so feel free to flat your tires anytime yep. you're coming past, cl past Cleveland. Yep, and jump into whatever circle you need. Okay. <laughs> okay, next. Yep. I've been waiting so long, I think I forgot what I was going to say, but... Um, He's just setting the stage, that's all. Seriously, I think I forgot. That's all right, we can come back to you. I have that problem too. I mean, it is, what have we been here, seven and a half hours? We all start to get tired. We're all <laughs> leaky vessels. <coughs> Any other questions, thoughts, anything online? Nope, good. Well, like I shared with um, Laura, I forget everybody's names. I just say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bubba. <laughs> but we, we have gifts that sit bef with us all the time that don't say anything. I can't wait till the day you, we can hear them talk <coughs> and give us insight of what they've heard yes. and how they feel. Yeah. Huh? Definitely. We good? Okay. I think we'll call it. And let's see. So I think that will do us next week. We'll... Uh, pick up um, right here, motive and intent, and we'll talk a little bit more about intent, maybe some of the good intent rather than just all the heavy. <laughs> but, uh, um, okay.
So can I get somebody to close this out with some prayer? Any volunteers? <laughs> Hashem, thank you for everything you've given us in this time of study. Thank you uh, for all of the beautiful minds that are all around us. Thank you for the intelligence that you've given everyone, and I do ask that you give all of us the wisdom that we need for everything that we do in our lives. And I ask it, Hashem Mashiach, as we go forth from today into the new week. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, we'll pick up next week where we left off. Yes.